Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this NEA Big Read Waukesha Reads presentation on the honor flight. Um, at any time during the program tonight, you can type questions into the chat box on YouTube, and we will be compiling your questions uh, to be answered at the end of the presentation. Tonight, Amy Luft is with us. Her involvement with the Stars and Stripes Honor Flight began back in 2009 as a volunteer. And from there, she joined the board of directors, eventually serving as vice president. She served as the director for guardian training, assisted in the call center, and worked closely with the medical team in organizing flights. After completing more than 40 flights, Amy transitioned off the board, but continues to be very involved in the Speakers Bureau and in volunteering on flight days. She's also very active with the American Legion Auxiliary and is currently the president of the second district. To tell us more about the Honor Flight Network, I'd like to welcome Amy Luft. Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this presentation tonight. There's nothing that I like more than talking about a program that is near and dear to my heart and that is Stars and Stripes Honor Flight. So I would like to thank um, you and Sarah and the team at Waukesha Public Library for allowing this presentation tonight for the community. And before we start, I also, I, I'm not sure how many folks are viewing, but um, if there are veterans who are watching tonight, I'd like to do a shout out to all of you. Um, thank you so much for your service. We, we get to enjoy our freedoms each and every day because of your sacrifices. And I want you to know that the community has not forgotten what you have done for us. So thank you so much for, for your service to our country. I'm going to go ahead and um, start and uh, share my screen here. And we do have a PowerPoint presentation that we'll, I will uh, take you through tonight. And uh, like, the, like they said, if we can answer questions at the end. Um, just put them into the chat and I'll be glad to, um, to answer those for you. So when I was getting ready to get the presentation together for tonight and getting my thoughts together, I, I just started thinking about the history and what we were doing with Stars and Stripes Honor Flight. And what we're gonna cover a little bit tonight is the history and how the Honor Flight program began, in particular Stars and Stripes Honor Flight, which is our Milwaukee chapter hub. But I want to take you behind the scenes and tell you what it's like for the veterans to be on a flight, share some of the um, insights, what, what we call honor flight magic, and um, let you know what the day is like for, for the veterans. And then also share with you what you can do to help us continue our great mission. So in talking about the honor flight program, you know, it's really come to my top of mind that this is really a program in our communities that has struck a nerve with so many people. And I wonder about what is it that has just pulled at everybody's heartstrings about this program? And it kind of dawned on me, I mean, veterans are all around us, right? I mean, who amongst us doesn't know a veteran? Whether it's somebody in our family, somebody we work with, it could be a neighbor, somebody we go to church with, but gosh, you know, there's so many veterans, especially in our communities in southeastern Wisconsin. And since 9-11, I think we've really seen a difference in attitudes when it comes to veterans. We hear much more often now, thank you for your service. I grew up as a teenager in the 80s and you know, that wasn't top of mind. We didn't acknowledge them as we should have. And I think that's really come full circle because I see the younger generation really having more of an interest um, with the veterans and wanting to learn and hear their stories. So it's really a silver lining that has come out of a, a, a tragic thing, but um, it is much more top of mind awareness with, with our communities. Our mission with Stars and Stripes Honor Flight, it's actually a two-part mission. It's first and foremost, the obligation to fly our World War II veterans, Korean veterans, Vietnam, and actually any veteran from any war era who is terminally ill out to Washington, DC to see their memorials that stand in their honor. But the second part of that mission 
is to also make sure that their stories we remain vibrant within our community. So we work very closely with the schools in southeastern Wisconsin, getting the veterans into the schools, getting them into the media, listening and hearing their stories because we want to make sure that their legacy continues to live on. And there's no better way to do that than to hear it right from those veterans. We are a 100% volunteer organization and we also operate on 100% donations. I am proud to say that 98 cents of every dollar we bring in goes directly back to flying the veterans. Honestly, there's not too many nonprofit organizations that can stand up proudly to say that. We're very frugal with our money, but we know the importance and, and the mission behind it. So um, it's a great thing. Um, it's all volunteers and all donation. And we'll talk a little bit more of that at the end of this program. So the Honor Flight program started because of this memorial. This is the World War II Memorial out in Washington, DC. And sadly, it took 60 years for this memorial to, to um, be projected and, and put out there in the community. And um, by that time, many of our World War II veterans financially and physically weren't able to get out to Washington, D.C. to see their very own memorial. There was a lot of controversy behind the scenes on First of all, having a memorial in Washington, D.C., a lot of folks thought we already had one and they were referring to Iwo Jima Memorial, the Marine Corps Memorial, and we had remind them that that's not a memorial for World War II, that's just the Marine Corps. And then there was a lot of controversy on where to place this memorial. It is actually right on what they call the National Mall area. Um, so there was a lot of delay with the um, this memorial being created and by the time it did open, it was April of 2004. So you can imagine 60 years later, the age factor that we were dealing with on these World War II veterans. This memorial actually honors the 16 million who served during the armed forces and the more than 400,000 that died while serving. There, it's an oval shaped memorial. There are two main entrances, those big pillars. Um, and they represent the Pacific and the Atlantic theaters. And then there are 56 granite pillars that stand 17 foot tall, and they each represent the states and the territories. Now, the birth of Honor Flight actually started with that gentleman on the left-hand side. That is Mr. Earl Morris, and he is a physician's assistant at a VA in Dayton, Ohio. I believe now he has retired, but um, that's where his career was. And he had, um, as you can imagine, many World War II veterans were his, his patients. And when he knew that the World War II Memorial was open and um, he started asking his patients one by one, hey, are you gonna go out to Washington DC to see your memorial? And sadly, one after another said, no, I'm not gonna go. I can't afford it. I'm too physically frail and, and can't go. I can't make the trip. I have to stay and take care of my spouse. I'm the caregiver. And he was heartbroken to know that this generation waited so long to first of all, have a memorial for them, for them. And now they didn't have the means to get out there. Well, ironically, Earl Morris is a private pilot. So he belonged to a small a group of pilots and he had his own very small airplane, um, but he was talking to his other buddies who were pilots and he was telling him the story that, you know, my, my patients, these World War II veterans, they, they're never gonna see their memorial. They're gonna pass away and, and they need to have this honor to see it. So he posed to his, his friends, he said, what if we do this? What if we load up a bunch of veterans and take them out there for the day? And he said, but it's gotta be more than that. He said, we're not just gonna drop them off and let them walk around. We're gonna be with them the entire day. And we're gonna to listen to their stories and we're gonna let them see the memorials out there. But here's what we're gonna do guys. We're not gonna have them pay for any of it. This is gonna be our treat for them. And ironically, the handful of friends that he had and he was pitching this story to, they said, yeah, we're in, we wanna do that. So they loaded up 12 World War II veterans May of 2005, 
and they took them out to Washington, D.C. for the day. I think there was four or five of these airplanes, and that really was the birth of Honor Flight. Well, that program quickly grew, and fast forward to 2008, the gentleman on the left-hand side in the sports court, that is Mr. Joe Dean, and he is the past mayor of Port Washington. He saw a segment on TV about this thing called Honor Flight and what Earl Morris was doing. At this point now, this is 2000 and end of 2006, beginning of 2007, and Earl was um, taking larger planes but buying commercial tickets and getting as many veterans in the area out to see the memorial. And Joe saw this segment about it, and he went to bed that night, and he thought to himself, geez, what a great program. Somebody should do that in Wisconsin. Well, he goes on to tell the story that he woke up the next morning and kind of scratched his head and thought, well, I know who's going to do this. And he gets on the phone and he calls what he he calls us one of his busiest friends. And he called us and he said, hey, I got an idea. I want to pitch it to you. So he told us about the program and we were all highly intrigued about it and honestly didn't have a lot of funds to start. We did a couple of brat fries in Port Washington and raised some money, um, we took a flight. And I wasn't on that first flight, but I knew about it. I knew that they, what they were doing and I was helping with spreading the word about it. But because of the uh, initial group and the fundraising they did, they bought some commercial tickets and we took our first flight from Ozaki County veterans that were on that flight out to Washington, D.C. And that was November of 2008. We had 68 veterans. And it was a huge success. And the team, um, you know, we kind of sat back and we thought, great, you know, we did it. It was successful. We didn't know what to think after that. Like, were we going to do this again? Were we not? Maybe the guys aren't that interested. Maybe the community is not going to get involved. Well, we couldn't be farther from the truth because what happened was a good thing. These veterans all came back and guess what they did? They started telling all of their buddies, you got to go on this thing called Honor Flight. It's the best day ever. And um, our wait list exploded. Within a year, we had over 1,200 World War II veterans on a wait list waiting to fly. So now we're panicking because we're thinking, how are we going to get these veterans out to Washington, D.C.? Because we know that time is of the essence. Every 90 seconds, a World War II veteran nationwide passes away. So we knew we had to work quickly and we had to get enough funds built up and we had to take as many flights as possible. Well, we started flying in early 2009 and we were flying commercially. We were just buying tickets. We were on the airplane with people going to Walt Disney World. They were on their vacations and we took as many veterans as we could, but that wait list kept growing and growing and growing. So we knew we had to do some major fundraising. So we reached out to the media. And lo and behold, Charlie Sykes, who was an icon in um, the radio industry here, who worked with WTMJ 620 AM, he embraced our program and he helped us get the word out there. We started doing interviews with veterans, we started doing radiothons, and we started raising money because we needed to fly more often. And honestly, planes are a little bit more expensive than, than cars are. So we thought, okay, we're gonna have to charter an airplane because we can't get these veterans out there fast enough. Well, we started receiving some remarkable um, amount of support from the community. And to this, to this day, one of my favorite memories and donations that came in was from the radiothon that we did at WTMJ. It came actually from a 94-year-old widow. Um, her husband was a World War II Navy pilot, and um, he flew overseas during World War II. And she was listening to the program on the radio. She sent us a donation with a handwritten letter. And it said, I don't have very much money left, but what I have, I want to give to you because my husband would have loved to been on one of these honor flights. And we opened it up and there was a check in there for $7.47. And that's where we got the idea. We were going to get a 747 to come into Milwaukee. Now, if you're not familiar with the 747s, those are those double-decker, huge airplanes. They, they carry 300 people. So we're like, we're going to get 300 veterans onto these planes and get them out there. 
That's how we'll get through this wait list. So we launched what we called Operation Resolve. Our group got together and we said, we are resolved. We are coming together to resolve this wait list and we're gonna do it within a year. So we pitched the idea to Charlie Sykes and he looked at us and he said, you guys are crazy. First of all, 747s don't even come into Milwaukee General Mitchell Airport. And he said, you're never gonna get enough money to even purchase one of those airplanes. And we said, let us try. So we did. We did tons of fundraising. We had tons of corporate support in the area, lots of donations from people. And guess what? We raised not enough money for just one 747, not two, but three. We did three 747s in 2010, and we cleared out that wait list of our World War II veterans. That was only possible because of the support from the community. So we are forever grateful for that. And here's a picture of one of the 747s. Uh, we have the military out there saluting us before we leave. And um, it was just a remarkable couple of years. Well, after that, uh, we decided as a hub, hey, this is a great thing we have to do for our community. The community is really backing it. We want to continue to do this. As a hub, we could have stopped after the World War II veterans because remember, this was for them and their memorial, but we knew the importance about letting all of the veterans have this opportunity. So we decided to continue with the program. We moved on to the Korean veterans and now most recently, what I call the teenagers of the group, the Vietnam vets. So that top picture you see, that's our first um, flight of our Korean veterans. And the one below is um, a more recent one of one of our Vietnam vets out there. So again, we're still flying World War II. If they're out there and available and they want to go on a flight, we still fly them. They go to the top of the list and then the Korean and then the Vietnam. So you're probably wondering, how do we keep track of all this, right? Well, we have a little color coded scheme that we put together. So when we are on the flight with these hundreds and hundreds of veterans, we know what war era they came from. The World War II veterans are in that dark navy blue. The Korean veterans are in that royal blue and the Vietnam veterans are in what I would call that periwinkle. They all fly with a guardian. So the guardians, which who, who are their chaperones for the day, they have the red jacket. So that's our little inside scheme on how we keep them all, all, all straight. It's, a, it's an early morning at General Mitchell Airport. So this is a one day flight for these veterans. Um, they arrive at the airport at the wee hours of the morning. Um, Check-in is between 4.30 and 5.30. And from the time they get to the airport, we treat them like kings and queens for the day. Uh, they get their picture taken with their guardian. We serve them breakfast. A lot of times we'll have dignitaries on there to greet them. Um, that's past Governor Scott Walker down there. And our volunteers are just there to take care of them um, from the moment they are there. So there's a lot of activity going on right from the beginning. We have a one-on-one -on -one ratio for each of our veterans. So that means each of, the, each of the vets fly with a guardian that really started out as a safety feature because of the World War II and the age that we are dealing with. But we decided to try to promote that whenever possible because the family member that flies with them really gets a feel for what it's like to have that story told from the veteran of what they went through. Again, a lot of these vets never talked about their war history. They haven't talked about it for decades. Some of them never shared their story, but Honor Flight has that Honor Flight magic where when they are amongst all those other veterans, their stories just start opening up and they start sharing. And what better way than to bring that younger generation, whether it's a son, daughter, grandchild, into that story with the veteran than, than right there in person. So one-on-one -on -one ratio, veterans fly with a guardian. The vets fly for totally free, and the veterans, they pay their guardian fee, um, which is advertised as $500, and that covers their flight and their apparel and their meals. And um, there we are boarding early in the morning. We, we board about 6.30 in the morning, and uh, we're pushing off on that bottom picture there, and that's a water cannon salute. Like I said, there's all kinds of surprises that start very early in the day for the veterans. Water cannon, cannon salute is the highest salute given to pilots when they are retiring. So we do that for our veterans as well. 
And here's a picture on the inside of the airplane, you know, anticipation runs high. They're all excited for what the day is gonna bring. The cool thing about Honor Flight, every flight is a little different. So we have an agenda in our mind of what we wanna do and what we wanna see. There is very few hard stops throughout the day, but the safety of the veteran is the number one thing. So it all depends about how mobile our veterans are, um, and of course, weather and, and timing with that, but um, we, we see several different memorials throughout the day and um, every time it's a little bit different. So um, here they are all waiting. We, we, we many times set the veterans together on the airplane so that they're seated with other veterans and they can have that camaraderie and they can share their stories as well. Once we get out to Washington, D.C., we load on the buses. So those are another thing that we purchase and we have those buses for the day. So we actually have a convoy and we break into five different groups. They're color coded, uh, red, white, blue, green and gold. So I always joke and say we're patriotic first and Packer fans second. But every uh, veteran and guardian is loaded onto a bus for the day. It becomes their bus family. And then we drive into that National Mall area to start viewing the, the memorials. And one of the cool surprises that we have for the veterans is a police escort for the entire day. We learned very quickly how valuable having a police escort is, is in Washington, DC. If any of you have been out there, you know that the traffic is horrendous. Well, one of our early flights, we didn't have a police escort and it took us a long time to get through that heavy traffic. So we hire a police escort for the day and they let the veterans feel like dignitary. All the traffic stops, we go right through the red lights and um, it's almost like the parting of the Red Sea. Everybody pulls over and our convoy goes right through. The veterans love it. But again, one of those other surprises that we do for them. And so here we are at the, at the World War II Memorial. This is one of the early stops that we do um, throughout the day. You know, the veterans tell us that next to their wedding day and the birth of their children, that the honor flight day is one of their best memories and the best days of their lives. And sadly for many of them, it might want be one of the last big missions. So again, we, we have a full day filled with lots of surprises. This isn't just healing for these veterans, it's also very healing for these families and to come together and to share this with the, with the families is, is just remarkable. So we view and we spend a lot of time at all of these memorials. I, I say we spend about 45 minutes to an hour at um, this memorial in particular. Um, we do usually a group picture out there and we can walk together as a group. Sometimes veterans just like to go off on their own. Um, and sometimes they like to just be with their guardian and we have a set time that everybody comes back to the um, back to the bus and then we head over to the next memorial. Um, this was a, a special trip for me. This was one of my very um, early flights. This was a veteran that I was matched up with. His name was George and um, I got a chance to sit with him on on the airplane and and got to know him quite well. Um, gosh, you know, he shared so much information with me, especially about his family. He was so proud of his family. By the time we got to Washington, D.C., I knew all about his children, his grandchildren, his wife, everything. He just was so, so proud. And we spent the day together and he was pretty mobile. Um, he was an avid bicyclist. So in addition to telling me all about his family, he told me all about all the bike tri trips that he took all across the United States. And luckily he had that white hat on because I had a hard time keeping up with him all day, but we had the best day ever and um, kept in touch with him for quite a, quite a time after the, after the flight. And unfortunately George passed away several years ago and I went to his funeral. And as soon as I walked in, his family rushed over. Oh, you have to come and see Papa's books. You have to see Papa's books. And, you know, I had never met his family, but they had recognized me from pictures. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go and take a look. And I went to the back of the room and he had three binders back there. One was his family. The second was all of his bicycle trips. And the third was his honor flight. He kept everything from that day. He had his lanyard in there. I think he even had his stir stick from our coffee, but that's how important this program is. 
three binders of his whole lifetime. He died when he was 89. That's the honor flight magic that we talk about. So this is the Korean Memorial. So, you know, this war, the Korean War, known as the Forgotten War, it just is sandwiched in between the greatest generation and all of the hoopla with that and then all the saga of the Vietnam War. But um, the Korean veterans get a chance to see their memorial while we are out there as well. The Korean Memorial opened in 1995 and there are 19 statues um, that no matter where you are standing while you are out at the memorial, they are one of the statue is always looking at you. It's kind of eerie. Um, but they're supposed to be representing them walking through a rice, pa a rice paddy um, in, in, Viet in uh, Korea. So this is a really important memorial for our Korean veterans. When they were creating this memorial, the architect wanted to make 38 statues to represent the 38th parallel, but the planning commission said, no, we can't do that. We can't, it's too big, we can't do that. Well, there is a black granite wall that is on the side of this memorial. So the architect got, got wise and he made 19 statues, but at night he puts a light on there and the reflection of the shadows reflect off of that black wall to represent the 38. So the 30th parallel is very important to the Korean memorial. So we get a chance to spend some time here as well. And we also stop at the Air Force Memorial Boy, this is one of the prettiest memorials in Washington, D.C. It overlooks the entire pen Pentagon. And this memorial was open in 2006. So a lot of times when we stop here, we like to do a group picture with all of our Air Force memorials. And I love the lady veteran there. We don't have too many lady veterans. Um, I always tell them they are the rose amongst the thorns. And the ladies get a lot of attention on, on honor flight days. The other thing with the ladies, there's no wait for the bathroom. Not on honor flight days, long line with the men, but not with the women. So uh, we had a, a ladies flight dedicated back in 2011, and um, we had a big amount of uh, ladies. I think there was close to 60 some ladies on that flight, and we got a chance to stop at the Women's Memorial, and we had lunch there with them. Um, but otherwise, we don't get a whole lot. So they get a lot of special attention on honor flight days. Air Force Memorial has three gigantic spears and I'm sorry, there's not a picture of that, but they are to represent the, the Thunderbirds. So that is a fun memorial to stop to, especially for our Air Force team. This is the Marine Corps Memorial, also known as Iwo Jima. And we always have a chance to stop here too. A lot of times we'll do a big group picture here. And then we try to gather as many of our Marine Corps Memorials as we, uh, veterans as we can to get a picture um, of them as well. Um, this memorial was dedicated, President Eisenhower was actually president, and that was um, dedicated in 1954. That flag at the top there, that flag flies 24-7, 365 days a year. So very, very impressive, a huge mammoth memorial. Um, so it's really fun to have the veterans all lined up there, and we take usually a big group picture when we're out there. And of course, the, the Vietnam Wall. Um, this is very, very meaningful for the Vietnam veterans who is the base of who we're flying right now. Um, even though a lot of them have seen the wall, um, it's really different when you're out there with uh, a ton of other veterans and the camaraderie. Um, a lot of closure happens um, at this wall. There is 58,000 names out there. This memorial was opened in 1982. There's actually 70 separate panels that make up that V, v shape and all of the names are arranged chronologically in order by date. Um, there's park rangers out there that help you identify the name and locate it if, if you can't find it. So um, very, very rewarding for, for everybody, especially our Vietnam veterans. And then Arlington National Cemetery is a one stop that we always make sure uh, we're able to, um, to stop at. You know, this is the only cemetery, national cemetery, that, that holds service members from every war. And to date, there was approximately 20 to 25 funerals held daily. It's just amazing. Um, very solemn um, 
stop. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to always get to see the changing of a guard, sometimes even a laying of a wreath. So it's a very, very um, humble experience. And a lot of the veterans haven't seen this ceremony. Sometimes we even get a chance to stop at the Pentagon. Not always. Like I said, every flight's a little bit different. There's a lot of security at the Pentagon, but we've had some chances to stop there as well. And it's been very, very meaningful when we, when we have an opportunity to do that. I think that's what's so fun about um, the Honor Flight is we just never know what places we're going to have a chance to stop at. Um, and uh, every flight, like I said, is a little bit different. The fun thing about the flights is the dignitaries that come out and the, the public that's there to greet us. Admiral Dirk Debing um, from Oconomowoc actually had his office at the Pentagon. So he always came when there was a Wisconsin honor flight and he always came to greet the veterans. And Senator Bob Dole, he was very inspirational in the opening of the World War II Memorial. He himself is a World War II veteran. So him and his wife, Elizabeth, they try to come out um, and greet the veterans. And it's a great photo opportunity with the vets. Um, the last couple of flights, um, his health um, has been affecting him. So we'll, we'll see with the upcoming um, flights if he'll be there. If he can, he will certainly make it. And of course, the bombshell girls are a big hit with the veterans. They, they love having their pictures taken with them. So a lot of fun things that go on throughout the day. It's just amazing when we are at these memorials, just the general public that come up and thank the veterans, total strangers. Um, just and especially the youth. There's a lot of kids that will come up and, and thank the veterans and want to shake their hands and want to have their pictures taken. Um, really is a, a good feeling, really warms your heart. Well, after we are done um, viewing the memorials for the day, we get back onto our bus that has been waiting for us and uh, we, we go back to the airplane and we have our meal on the bus. We get our lunch and our dinner served on the bus and we get back to the airplane and we head back to Milwaukee. Um, it's usually about 6.30, 7 o'clock when we're ready to fly back home. So it has been a full day. And just thinking, you know, all those veterans were at the airport wee hours of the morning. So a lot of them have already been up, you know, 16, 17, 18 hours. Well, the lights are off in the airplane. All of us guardians are sleeping and the veterans are still under second and third wind, right? Well, what we do is we throw the lights on and we do mail call for the veterans. We reenact mail call because we know how important it is for those veterans to get those letters, especially when they were serving. That was their only communication back home. So what we do is we secretly um, contact their family members and we ask their family and friends to write letters to the veteran. And we ensure that every veteran has a big envelope full of cards from families and friends thanking them for their service. We stand up in the plane, we call off their name, and all you see is this little hand waving over the seat, and they're so excited to get their letters. On one flight, I was walking up the aisle, and I just happened to be looking over the shoulder of a veteran who was reading a a letter and I, I it looked like a letter from somebody at home, a family member. And I knelt down and I said to him, oh, what a special card you have there. And he turned to me with tears streaming down his cheeks. He said to me, I didn't know they loved me anymore. So pretty impactful. These veterans read through those letters over and over and over again. It's really important and it's really a fun surprise for all of them. I had to take this picture the day I was on this flight. We tell the veterans that they can wear any part of their uniform that still fits them. Well, this was the only part that fit this gentleman and he wore it all day long. He was so proud of his hat. But that gentleman at the bottom, um, his name was Fred. He wore that World War II outfit all day long and it's a heavy wool and it was such a warm day when we were out there. I asked Fred several times, are you sure you don't wanna take off your jacket? And he, he said absolutely not. He was so proud, number one, that he could fit into his uniform, but he was just so proud to wear it. He kept that uniform on all day. Now, remember when I said that our veterans fly with guardians, sometimes there are, are veterans who just don't have any family member who can fly with them. We have volunteers that are trained and have paid their way, and sometimes we even use 
active duty, like in that picture there, they don't get charged to fly with us. We just appreciate their service. But a lot of times we'll match active duty folks up with the veterans, which is such a fun thing. I mean, look at the generation difference there and think of the stories that they shared. Those two became what, well, what Fred said, he was a pen pal. Um, he wrote, those two wrote back and forth to each other and um, he passed away several years ago, but I know she did go to the funeral because the family told me. So, you know, how cool to have a new friendship when you're 80 or 90 years old and your circle of friends is shrinking. That's what comes out of Honor Flight is all these new friendships. Pretty special. The highlight of our flight is the homecoming event. So we have that image of that ticker tape parade picture, right? That Navy sailor kissing the girl in the streets of New York, right? Well, that didn't happen as much as we think it did. Um, my dad was World War II and him, like a lot of the other veterans, they came home, they threw their bag in the corner, they changed their clothes, they went to work and they started families. There was no welcome home. We give them that welcome home that they didn't get the first time. So we have a huge surprise for them back at General Mitchell Airport when we land. And we land, we try to land between 8.30 and 9.30 at night and we don't always hit that target, um, but um, we're, we're getting better at that. Um, but it's a long day and we come home and there are thousands of people at the airport waiting to greet these veterans. All they wanna do is see their vets come home. They wanna shake their hands. They wanna say thank you for their service. The veterans have no idea. Um, they nowadays maybe know that there is a, pro, a, a parade and a, an event, but they have no idea that there are thousands of people. We max out General Mitchell Airport. Our last couple of flights, they estimated there was 5,000 people there. And it's great to see the different groups, uh, a lot of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and of course the family members. And when you think of the Vietnam veterans, boy, there is nobody who deserves a welcome home more than that group. Um, they, they were just so disregarded when they came home. So it has been um, a lot of fun doing the homecoming events for our veterans. I always tell everybody, this is a bucket list thing. If you have not come to the airport for a welcome home, please add it to your list. At least come to one of them. You will not regret it. And sadly, there's not going to be too many flights left where we have some World War II veterans around. So if you want the opportunity to look a World War II veteran in the eyes and say thank you for your service, please come to the airport. The public is, is welcome. Um, there's little areas that we allow the families to have up close and personal action with the veterans. But um, I really encourage folks to do this. It's a great learning experience. I've had the great opportunity in my role um, with Stars and Stripes on a flight to call the veterans to tell them that they've been selected for a flight. It's one of the most rewarding things to do. The veterans feel like they've won the lottery, um, but with most of them, they are just so happy. They say they've been waiting for this call. This gentleman here, I, I called him and I, he was a World War II veteran and I told him he was selected for a flight and he was a little hesitant. He said, um, Amy, I don't have anybody to fly with. And I reassured him that we have volunteers and I'm pretty sure it was that active duty military right there. That was his guardian for the day. And um, I said, we're gonna match you up with somebody. You're gonna be in good hands. And um, he accepted, he wanted to go on the flight. And then he went on to tell me that he had one son um, that he, well, I think there was a couple of sons, but the one son that was local, he was estranged from him. They had not spoken for over 12 years. And um, he said, I just, I know he's not going to want to fly with me. And, you know, if you can get me a volunteer, I'll go. So I reassured him and, and him and his, his buddy there, that active duty military, his guardian, they had a great day. Well, remember when I told you that we secretly contact the family members to get the mail call? Well, we called that son in Milwaukee and we told them that his dad was going to come on an honor flight. And could he please write some letters and get the family and friends to write letters? Well, guess what? that son came to the airport and our photographer captured this video, this picture. Those two hadn't talked or seen each other in over 12 years. And to see the two of them embrace like this was just overwhelming. And the son told me 
quite a ways after this, um, months after that, him and his dad now talked every single day. He said that would not have happened if it wasn't for honor flight. So that's what we talk about when we say honor flight magic. This is what happens behind the scenes. None of this would be possible if it wasn't for our volunteers. This is one of the few organizations that I belong to where we're just so grateful to have so many volunteers that want to come out and help. Um, this is the backbone to our organization. These people dedicate tons and tons of hours. These, one, these folks here, they're at the airport at like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning getting the wheelchairs ready, getting everything set up. Us board members, we get to sleep in. We don't have to be there till like four, but they do all sorts of um, behind the scenes things and we could not do it with their, without their help. Many of them have been with us for years and um, we have a application process for accepting new volunteers. We don't have an open um, application where anybody can apply. We open up that process maybe once a year where we'll take some new um, applications, but it's almost to the point where we were like, thanks, but no thanks. We just have so many people that want to help. And again, you know, it pulls at their heartstrings too. So um, we're very, very fortunate as an organization to have so many volunteers help us. I wanted to share this, this story with you. This was probably one of the most profound flights I was on. Um, so this World War II veteran was wheelchair bound. And again, I had the honor and the privilege of calling him on the phone and telling him he had been selected for a flight and he said um he didn't have anybody to fly with and we got him a, a guardian there who was trained and ready to go and um so he he agreed to go and um before i hung up the phone he he asked me he said um he told me that his son fought in vietnam and his son died while serving and he said, Amy, my, my son's name is on that wall. And I've never been to Washington, D.C. I've never seen it. But when we get out there, are you going to be on the flight with me? And I told him I was going to be there. And he said, would you help me find my son's name? And I said, yes, of course I will. And I hung up the phone and I just thought to myself, what did I do? There's 58,000 names on that wall. But remember, I said there's volunteers from the park there. So they helped us. We found his son's name. And to watch this wheelchair bound veteran use all of his strength to stand up and just reach out and touch his son's name on the wall. And then he stood back and he saluted it was probably the most profound thing I've ever seen in my life. And then he sat down and I was standing next to him at that point and he kind of tugged at my shirt and he said, I can go home now. And then I got all nervous because I thought, well, we have a whole day plan, but it was okay. We got to see all the rest of the memorials and he had a wonderful day, but that veteran passed away six days later. And now I know what he meant when he said, I can go home now. He needed to have that closure. If it wouldn't have been for honor flight, he would have never had that opportunity to see his son's name on that wall. And I'm sure he thought about that for years and years and years, but thanks to honor flight, that honor flight magic, it's not always about the memorial, even though it is, but it's about the healing and the closure for these veterans. So I don't tell you that story to make you sad because there are a lot of tears that are shared on honor flight days. But I think it, I, I believe it's tears of joy for all of these veterans. And I can tell you that there are so many smiles that are shared and so many new friendships that are made with um, all of our flights. Now on the back of our apparel, we have our slogan and it's every day is a bonus. We got that slogan from a veteran who was on our very first honor flight. His name was Joe Demler, and Joe was from my neighborhood up in Port Washington, and he has an amazing story. Joe was a strapping young teenager, an athlete, athletic young man from Port Washington High School, and after he graduated, World War II broke out, and he enlisted, and he served, but right before the end of the war, he was captured, and he was thrown into a Nazi German prisoner camp. And they tortured him and they starved him 
for three months. And on the day that his camp was liberated, a time, a life magazine photographer came in and took a picture of Joe. Now, when Joe enlisted into the army, he was 170 pounds. On the day that the Life Magazine photographer took a picture, he was 69 pounds. That's Joe Demler on that cot. The gentleman next to him on that cot couldn't even hang on another day. He died that day. So Joe was on our very first flight, and Joe told, about, told us all about his story and how they tortured all of these prisoners and how they starved them. And we said to him, Joe, how did you make it through that terrible situation? And Joe said, I learned two things. I learned to pray every day. And I learned that every day I can stay alive is a bonus. So we captured that slogan and we put that on the back of all of our apparel. It says every day is a bonus. And to this day, we still feel that every day is a bonus. This is Joe Demler, and I'm sad to say he passed away this last um, February, um, but he is um, an icon with our program. He was at every single honor flight um, at the airport for the homecoming event. He was in our movie, um, the honor flight story, the mission, and um, he raised his family in Port Washington, never talked about his private story. Um, until we kind of pulled it out of him. And with that, he went into a lot of schools and did a lot of interviews. And um, he was a remarkable, remarkable man. He's many of the ones, um, many prisoner of wars, many Purple Hearts. Um, he was somebody from the greatest generation. And I also um, wanted to share this story with you. Um, this was from one of our last flights. This is a Vietnam veteran. And um, his name was Paul, and he came up to me early in the morning. This was a flight last fall, and um, he was so excited. He had tears in his eyes and just so excited to be on the honor flight. And he said it was the best thing that's happened. He was so great to be there. He was so excited. And I thought to myself, gosh, it's 630 in the morning. We haven't even loaded the plane, but he was just so ecstatic. And he said, you know what, Amy, I have never told anybody I'm a Vietnam veteran because I haven't been proud of it. He said, I came home from serving. I actually took my uniform off in the car and I threw it out the window. But he said, after today, I'm gonna go and buy my very first Vietnam veteran cap, cap and I'm gonna wear it proudly. Well, after his flight, he wrote us a letter and I'm gonna read it to you. His first name was Paul and Paul writes, even until I arrived at the airport on the day of my flight, I was very unsure about participating. I still had some baggage left over from serving in Vietnam, and the reception I received coming home in 1971 was not good. My honor flight experience was literally life-changing. The welcome home at Mitchell Airport was an overwhelming experience. I was also amazed by the kindness and the understanding of my guardian and of all the details that were attended to during the day. As a result of the honor flight, I have become more open about my military experience and more aware of my feelings about being a Vietnam veteran. I strongly urge any veteran who is considering honor flight to sign up and participate I offer a heartfelt thank you to all who have organized and supported this amazing program. Again, this is what happens to these veterans after they go on a flight with us. So currently there are 131 hubs across 46 states. Our program has grown in Wisconsin. We now have five hubs. Milwaukee was the first hub and is the largest but we also have hubs in Madison, La Crosse, Wausau, and Appleton. To date, our Milwaukee Stars and Stripes Honor Flight Hub has flown 7,606 veterans. We have now completed 56 flights. Unfortunately, 2,020 flights have all been canceled due to COVID. Uh, we were hopeful that maybe we'd be able to fly, but National has said we are unable to do that until further notice. 
our board has medical directors and medical personnel that fly with us and they are monitoring this situation on a regular basis. Um, so right now, unfortunately, I have to tell you that our flights are all on hold for 2021. If we were to fly, we typically fly late March, early April, all through April, all through May, and sometimes early June. We don't fly end of June, July, or August because it's just way too hot out in Washington, D.C. And then we fly in the fall as well, usually September, October, and early November. Um, so what I would encourage all of you to do is to follow us on Facebook, even if we are your one and only friend, like Stars and Stripes Honor Flight, but look at our website, the address is below, and help us find veterans who haven't flown yet. First and foremost, when you see a veteran, thank them for their service, and then ask them, have you been on an honor flight? And assist them with getting signed up. We are encouraging veterans to continue to sign up. It is a first come, first serve basis with the oldest, the World War II, the Korean, and then Vietnam in that order. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed that we'll be flying in 2021. I'm guessing it's not going to happen in the spring, but hopefully in the fall. But the best thing I can do is to encourage you to follow us on Facebook, check our website, and of course, the, the media will be updating the community as well. I'd like to, uh, to leave you with, with this encouragement. This is an inscript that's on the World War II Memorial from President Harry Truman. It says, our debt to our heroic men and valiant women in the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifice. And um, that's what we feel as an honor flight team. Um, we want to make sure that the veterans know they are not forgotten. We have vowed to continue with this program until every veteran has an opportunity to take an honor flight. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more than just the memorials. There's a lot more behind the scenes. There's a lot of healing. There's a lot of closure. But most importantly, there's a lot of joy that comes out of the Honor Flight program. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to tell the, the Honor Flight story. Um, if there are any questions, I am um, happy to, to answer them at this time. Hi, Amy. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in and some of them I think you did answer along the way, but I'm gonna go through and, and share a couple of them with you. Excellent. Let's see. So um, somebody asked, are veterans able to go more than once? Good question. Um, no, it is a once and only flight. So if they have flown at um, our hub, we keep track of obviously um, which veterans have flown with us, but we do have a national, Honor Flight's a national program, so we do have access to other hubs where um, if we would know that a veteran has flown somewhere else, we would kindly ask that they refrain because we do have a wait list of veterans who um, are still anxiously waiting to get on a flight, so it's a one-time deal. Okay, and is everybody who um, applies to go, is everybody allowed to go, or is there a selection process? Well, um, so again, it's World War II first, mm -hmm. and then Korean, and then Vietnam. Um, we are able to take any, pretty much any level of a veteran. So what I mean by that is, if they are wheelchair bound, we can handle that. Um, if they're um, if they have a catheter or if they're amputee, we've even taken blind veterans because there's Braille on the memorials. We have a medical team, we have two doctors on our board and they review every application. Um, the only time they would have some concerns is maybe if somebody um, has some pretty onset um, Alzheimer's or dementia where it wouldn't be safe for them to fly. But quite honestly, I really don't know if we've ever turned a veteran away because we'll have, let their, their guardian fly with them if they've got dementia, that's usually a good fit. Um, the guardians do have um, requirements, so they have to be between the ages of 18 and 65, no spouses, and there has to be a generation between the veteran and the guardian. So if it's a Vietnam veteran, because remember I called them our sassy teenagers, some of them could be in their 60s, 
um, there has to be at least like 15 years, a generation difference between that age gap between the guardian and the veteran. Guardians pay their, their fee to fly and they also have to come to a mandatory training program. There were a couple of questions about the guardians. So um, someone had said specifically, what is the role of a guardian? Safety. Safety of the veterans is the number one thing. And then it's just to make sure that the veteran has a wonderful and memorable day. Um, it's giving the veteran whatever they want in a safe atmosphere, letting them see the memorials that they want, um, listening to their story, letting them share their story, learning from it, giving them a new friendship. So if it's a family member, we just want you to embrace the opportunity. Um, as a, a daughter of a veteran, unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to go on a flight with my dad. So anytime I can get a daughter or a son matched up and go on a flight and share that opportunity or a grandchild, I mean, it's such a blessing to do that. But um, safety is the number one importance of our veteran. And what kind of training does the guardian go through? Yep, there's a training class that's held a week before the flight, and it's, it's about a three-hour training program. So we take them through the itinerary. We tell them about the safety hazards at any memorial. We tell them about what the day is going to be like. We go through some medical stuff with them. Um, we just answer questions that they may have. A lot of family members think, why do I have to sit through a three-hour training program? I know my veteran that I'm flying with, but you have to remember, we're taking them into a foreign area. So we're taking them to a place where they maybe haven't been before, and their slips, trips, and falls are the biggest concern with our veterans. A lot of them, if it's a sunny day, they're wearing glasses. They don't move as quickly as we do. They may trip on something. A trip for an 80-year-old, a fall, that could be devastating because that they may end up at going to the hospital. And then what a bummer, they don't come back with the rest of the group then for their homecoming event. Knock on wood, we have a pretty good track record. We, but we take that, that training seriously. So we make sure our guardians are fully tra trained that they have no um, surprises on the day of the honor flight and what their role is as a guardian. And someone else had asked, um, how would you get involved as a guardian for people who don't have someone to go with them? Yeah, I kind of knew we were going to get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, back in 2008, 2009, we only had, I would say, 20% family members flying with the veterans. Um, I had a couple of uh, vets that I was a guardian for. I think it was because people in the community just weren't that aware of our program. Well, now what we're experiencing is about 95% family members are flying, which is a great thing for the veteran. Unfortunately, but unfortunately, it leaves the community who wants to help their left out. So early on, we were accepting random guardian applications and they were sitting there anxiously waiting to be matched up with a veteran. Unfortunately, we do not have an open enrollment process anymore for the guardians. The few times I've picked off that guardian list and had to match somebody up with a veteran who didn't have anybody, I think their application was actually from 2014. That's how long they've been sitting on a wait list because a lot of the veterans nowadays, which is a great thing, but now they're flying with family members. So what I always encourage people to do is go out into the community and find a veteran who wants to go on the flight and if they don't have somebody to fly with, sign up together. There is an application on our website that the veteran can fill out, and there's an application for the guardian to fill out. You can fill it out online, or you can complete it by hand and send it in to us. Great. Um, another question was, are there medical personnel that fly with you to help the veterans if they need it? Yes, absolutely. Every flight, again, is a little different, and it, it's based on the neediness of our veterans. If we have a lot of wheelchair bound or a lot of folks on oxygen, we will load up and have extra medical folks available. We have two physicians on our board of directors, and then they help get extra medical that we need for the flight. So a lot of times there'll be RNs who are extra, um, a lot of EMTs, even firefighters. So our team works on getting those folks lined up for the, the amount of neediness that we need for each flight. I think she put that. 
Oh, there she is. You froze up for a second, Amy. We thought maybe we lost you. <laughs> okay, I'm just reading through the list of questions here. Um, someone asked, who are the bombshell girls? <laughs> You know, I haven't seen them out there for quite a while, but it's a group that um, just comes out to welcome the veterans. I think it's a, a just a nonprofit group. I think they do programs and presentations. Um, no affiliation with Stars and Stripes Honor Flight. They are out at the memorials when we get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's see. Um, someone asked, how do they donate to Honor Flight? Ah. Key question, yes. <laughs> we operate on 100% donations. If you go to our website, starsandstripeshonorflight.org, um, there's a, a link there that you can donate to. Um, we are nonprofit, so um, it's a tax um, exempt um, case for you, and um, you'll get an acknowledgement from our treasurer after you make a donation. Um, you can mail um, a donation in, and I don't know if we need to put that screen back on. It was the last one that had the address on it, um, but that's the best way to donate. If you are a shopper of Sendix, um, Sendix Groceries right now are doing a roundup, so ask to round up um, your, your um, grocery bill, and those donations will come into us. Sendix is one of our great sponsors, um, but really it's all donations, so either through the website or, or checks. Okay, and then the last question I have here is, um, when you go on an honor flight, do they do everything in a group or at some point do people split off and do things on their own? Right, so um, the veteran can actually, once we get to the memorial, um, the bus captain that's on their bus will let them know how long we're gonna spend at each memorial and what time the bus is gonna be back, um, where it will be for us to get back on the bus again. So a lot of times the veteran and the guardian will has the opportunity just to kind of go off on their own and view the memorial. Sometimes I've been a bus captain for many honor flights and uh, a lot of times the, the team or they like to follow along and then they'll go as a group and I can talk about the memorial a little bit with them, but really they are, they are not mandated to stay within the group. The most important thing is to know what time to be back for the bus so that we're not holding up that convoy of our five buses so that we can get to the next memorial. Uh, I had a question too. Um, when you come back and there are people at the airport, can anybody come and participate in that? Yes, yep. Public is welcome to come to the airport. Now we, we do have areas that the family can get the first front spots of the parade route. Um, but then, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of people from the public there. I'm always amazed of the um, youth that are there. There's a lot of Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. We have cheerleaders that come to cheer the veterans home. Um, so yes, um, please put that on your, on your bucket list. And I wish I had some dates to share with you uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that we can fly in 2021. We'll keep our fingers crossed for you too. Thank you. Sarah and I are sitting over here getting all teary listening yeah. to your stories. <laughs> it was a great presentation. Um, I don't see any more questions that came in. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, thanks for being part of Waukesha Reads. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and we appreciate the support from Waukesha Reads and um, also from the community for our veterans. Thank you. Thank you.